sorry, Rob, um, uh, who is the CEO of Goodwin House and Home. And we had the opportunity to preview the Stronger Memory Program with a, a, a small group uh, of villages uh, about a month ago uh, and with just rave reviews. So there's a couple housekeeping things I'd like to go over. Um, one is that we were asking everybody to mute themselves um, so that we give our speaker full attention. And then Rob, if it's okay with you, I would um, I'll monitor the chat room for questions and then I will call on people as um, you know they come up, uh, if that's okay with you. And you're on mute, Rob, so you have to unmute. That's great. <laughs> that's great. Thanks, Bubba. No problem. So I'll let you start. Um, and again, we'll, we'll take questions in the chat room. Um, we have a very large group today, which we knew we would. Um, so um, we'll try to get to everybody's questions as, as we can. Fantastic. And thanks again. Thanks to Village to Village Network for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, Barbara, in particular, along with Kim, I really appreciate all your efforts to help get the news about Stronger Memory out to your members. And uh, this is a quote that I wanted to start with. Uh, my name is Rob Liebrick, and I am the CEO and president of Goodwin House, which is based in Northern Virginia. Our mission is to support, honor, and uplift the lives of older adults and the people who care for them. We're a faith-based not-for-profit, and we've taken on the idea of sharing stronger memory uh, with as many people as we possibly can. I remember when I first came into service uh, to older adults in 2002, I would often ask groups of older adults, so how many of you want to live to 100? Fully expecting that the most hands would go up. Uh, and time and time again, uh, the reality was that most hands did not go up. The, the vast majority of people did not want to live to 100. And I found this fascinating each and every time. And I thought about the why. Uh, well, first and foremost, uh, the answer was that people were worried about running out of funds, running out of money. And the second thing that they would often follow up with that was they were really worried about losing their mind. And so uh, that is something that we're going to talk about today as it relates to stronger memory and the personal journey that I'd like to share with you. If we do everything right today, uh, we'll hopefully get you and those around you on the path to improving your brain health. So as I mentioned, this is a personal story I wanted to share. This is a, a picture of my mom, uh, Wendy Liebrick. She lives in Portland, Oregon, and uh, she's still a Beavers fan. They uh, lost to Houston yesterday, for those following yeah. the NCAA. So a, little, a little sadness there. But uh, if you're a Houston fan, you're probably pretty, pretty happy. Uh, and she's been married for 54 years, uh, three children, seven grandchildren, three grand dogs, and ultimately healthy. Uh, healthy by all considerations for brain health, v physically very active, stays physically fit, uh, continues to exercise on a regular basis, socially very active, college graduate, she's a non-smoker, which is a big indicator for future uh, challenges with dementia, uh, and ultimately uh, not, not a big drinker either. And so we have all these factors that are playing out for my mom. And uh, what we also recognize is that uh, even though she's healthy in so many ways, uh, we had some challenges that were starting to uh, creep up. So in 2011, we saw her repeating thoughts, uh, forgetting her conversations. And my dad, uh, who she's been married to now for 54 years, was getting frustrated. And what I would call that frustration is uh, getting scared. That here he was with this person who's known all his life and she was changing in front of his eyes. And so this started to impact her, her daily activities. She started to uh, have challenges recalling where she was going or why. Uh, this was a problem. This was a real problem. So this is a good time for us to, to dive into a little bit of context around what dementia is. Oftentimes we'll interchange uh, ideas, dementia or Alzheimer's and things like that. But dementia is the umbrella term for cognitive decline. It has a lot of other diseases and brain disorders underneath it, inclusive of Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common type of dementia. Though today, it's much more common to have multiple uh, types of dementia coming together at one time. So treating one type of dementia may not be effective 
uh, as people cha are challenged with dementia. And Alzheimer's and other dementias are not a normal part of uh, growing older. Uh, I think this is really important for us to recognize as well. Even though the prevalence of uh, Alzheimer's in particular after the age of 65 continues to grow and grow and grow. And after the age of 85, you have a, a nearly 50% chance of uh, having Alzheimer's uh, over time. One of the best charts that I've seen that describes this, this path or journey is here. It talks about how normal aging, you know, everyone experiences slight cognitive changes during aging. That's, that's to be expected. Uh, and then there's these phases where you go from preclinical, I love the last quote there, a stage where the patient knows, but the doctor doesn't. Uh, so many of uh, the people that I've interacted with, and certainly I'm sure the people that you've interacted with, are smart enough to fool a doctor for a period of 30 minutes or an hour. And so uh, they may walk out of there saying, oh, look, I got a clean bill of health, even though they know fully well that they're having some challenges. So the MCI or mild cognitive impairment, this is where we start to um, have more challenges and you can, uh, you can still get around, manage your overall activities of daily living, but over the course of five years, 38% of those with mild cognitive impairment start to have the formulation of dementia. And this is where we get into cognitive impairment that interferes with your daily uh, life experiences, all the way to the end stage or end stage dementia, where it's very severe, uh, where you've forgotten how to eat or how to go to the bathroom, uh, some elements of dignity that are really challenging for those who are inflicted by this, this horrible disease. And it is a disease. Uh, this is a, uh, hopefully no one had too much lunch. I apologize for those of you that did uh, coming into the one o'clock hour. Uh, but these are uh, two pictures of brains. One is a, what we call a normal brain. Uh, the other is an Alzheimer's brain. And you can tell a very distinct, distinct Distinctly, that this disease actually has a physical ac action that occurs with one. Uh, a healthy brain weighs about three pounds, where a severe Alzheimer's brain weighs one and a half pounds. So you're really seeing a, a tremendous shrinkage there. You're also seeing a shrinkage specifically in the area of the hippocampus, uh, which is the part of the brain that helps with the formation of new memories. And we know that the cortex are also damaged, uh, which take away your ability uh, to do uh, a number of things inclusive of thinking and remembering. So to successfully prevent Alzheimer's dementia, what do we need to do? Well, one thought is we don't need to, to solve it outright. We just need to push it off or stave it off for a number of years. And if we could do that for five, 10, 15, 20 years, if we could just push the symptoms of Alzheimer's dementia away, for that long, then someone who is already 65 might pass away naturally from other causes. And so never having to contend uh, with the deterioration, true deterioration of the cognitive decline. Unfortunately, as we all are aware today, there are no cures uh, for this. And yet here I was in 2011, confronted with my mom, uh, nine years into my service to older adults, and I had no answers for her. I had no way to come around to her and provide any support other than a listening ear. So when my mom took the test in 2011 and showed the brain function challenges, I, like so many others, were stuck. And then I went to a conference, a leading age conference. It's a conference of not-for-profit organizations like ours uh, that come together. This time it was in Denver. And a group out of Japan came to showcase their work uh, with a skilled nursing location in Ohio called Eliza Jennings. And they shared the news about Cyto. Now Cyto was what they called a learning therapy. And it was around the idea um, from Professor Ryutu uh, Kawashima out of Tohoku University. He had done some brain scans and done some research and found that doing some basic things, really basic things could help people even with nth stage dementia. And they had been utilizing these tools in Japan for a number of years. And now we're translating the results into the United States. And then the first time that they translated and brought the program into Eliza Jennings, every person that went through their program either experienced a stabilization of their testing scores or improved. 
And I don't know about you, but whenever you hear something like that, uh, two thoughts, one is too good to be true. And second thought is, well, if it is true, how can I use that same kind of idea to help others? And so the reality for me was the second thought. Uh, and that's where we started to think through, okay, well, this is for nth stage people, people that were in skilled nursing that were really struggling with dementia. What if, what if someone could start to use the same approach, but do it earlier before the dementia became so challenging? So I went back to my mom and I said, mom, what if we were to enroll you in a class with, in essence, first and second graders? And she said, you know what? I'm really wanting my brain health to be as strong as it can be. I'm scared uh, and I'm willing to try anything, which is a real testament to who she is as a person, a real trailblazer. And so I asked my mom to enroll in Kumon Learning. It's from the same group that, that created Saito. And Kumon, for many of you, you may know Kumon as a test prep uh, organization. They typically work with elementary school, middle school, or high school students on uh, getting better test scores on their way to college, et cetera. And so what I needed for her, what I thought we needed for her was some type of curriculum that she could do regularly and also a, a process of checking in with someone so that uh, she would have someone to be accountable to. I think we all value that accountability element. And so she started in this program. She started to do uh, simple math uh, through Kumon. And within a month between the math that she had started, uh, she started journaling more consistently and started reading out loud. Those are the three elements, reading out loud, handwriting, and simple math done quickly. We saw improvements within a month. Her repetition went away, her forgetfulness went away, uh, we knew that the brain, you know, there was no cure for these type of things, but the symptoms could have resolved. Awesome experience, awesome news. And I was still in service to older adults at this time. I was in Seattle and I was working for an organization called Aegis Living. And I had a colleague, Judy Wadsworth, say to me, your story about your mom is so compelling. What are you going to do for our residents? I was working at an assisted living memory care community. And it was a great question. You know, here we had a proven experience with my mom that if you could do these three basic things consistently, you might be able to see improvement in the brain. But that was just one person. You know, what about other people? Could you replicate it? And so we created uh, through the support of an up and coming occupational therapist, um, Helen Halpern, we created the Aegis Brain Level Engagement Program. And again, for our residents at Aegis Living on Madison, where we initiated this program, we saw improvements in behaviors. We saw improvements in recall. Uh, residents who had forgotten their primary care providers' names were starting to recall those names. Uh, we started to see people sleep better. So again, we, we showcased exactly what was the experience with the Sino program earlier with an nth stage dementia. We showcased it at an earlier stage uh, with the brain health. And we were having success. I subsequently moved to Maryland and uh, pulled back on, on the brain uh, function uh, focus. But a few years later, uh, when I was recruited and hired as the CEO and president of Goodwin House, I let the board know there that I had a desire with a program that I thought could be helpful to others. And if they were supportive, that we would roll it out and help as many people as possible. And so we created the full curriculum, a whole new curriculum uh, known as Stronger Memory. And that's what we're offering uh, and talking about today. In 2020, we took the curriculum and started to do sessions within Goodwin House. Goodwin House has two primary communities, Goodwin House Alexandria and Goodwin House Bailey's Crossroads. We have about 950 residents between the two. And we started to do uh, programs with both houses. This was in January of 2020. Uh, right before March occurred and the pandemic hit. And in the short window of time that we had to do the program, uh, we did testing of residents before and testing of residents after over just a course of a few months, in addition to the anecdotal stories we were hearing from people. And the testing for those that continued to do the program consistently throughout the weeks, we saw same thing, improvements or stabilization of test scores, which was very compelling. We have a program called Goodwin House at Home. So if folks want to stay uh, where they're at and receive services from Goodwin House, 
We also offer that as an option. You don't have to move to a community, for example. Uh, very, very uh, accommodating and in line which, uh, with, I think, the philosophy of the villages as well. And so for us, uh, we had about 185 members of Goodwin House at Home, and we had a very large group of interested uh, Goodwin House at Home members want to continue to also try out Stronger Memory. Uh, so we rolled that out with them and saw a really nice adoption and appreciation for the program as well. So much so that we were able to engage uh, George Mason University and do some research on the program where they were able to interview participants and validate uh, the success or not of the program. And just uh, this month, uh, earlier this month, George Mason University released a positive report on the impact of stronger memory on brain health, which is very exciting for all of us. So what is stronger memory? Uh, it's a program designed with the same concept in mind, doing three simple activities daily would basically engage the brain in a way that would be helpful, uh, additive, and make sure that people could hopefully stabilize or improve their cognitive function. No guarantees, because again, there's no cure for dementia, but we've seen consistently people who are uh, dedicated to the program have good success. I recall that with my mom, for example, and this was before we had rolled out Stronger Memory, but she was doing the same thing, same curriculum type approach. Uh, she was doing her math, she was doing her reading out loud, doing her writing, and this is a few years back, and all of a sudden she said to me, Rob, I, I don't think this is working. You know, I'm not, my brain's starting to, to uh, not do as well. I'm forgetting things. I'm not mem remembering conversations. And so we started to diagnose, like many of you might do. You know, are you sleeping okay? Uh, are there stresses in your life that we should be talking about? Are you on new medications? Uh, what about your B12? What about your thyroid? What about all these things that might be additional variables to, um, to the concern? and rolled out every single one of them in conversation. And then I asked her this question just out of curiosity. I said, mom, tell me about the math you're doing right now. Tell me about the math you're doing. And she said, oh, I'm, I'm working on division and it's harder and it's frustrating and it's not, not going very well. And I said, aha, mom, revert back. Go back to the easier math that you could do without a whole lot of anxiety. Just work through simple math quickly. Don't worry about harder math later on. And within a week, uh, her, her uh, symptoms went away. Uh, her brain function returned to what we've been experiencing over the last several years with the positive approach of being able to remember and recall. So that was my mom's experience. Now we have uh, Aegis Living's experience. And now we're seeing from Goodwin House, and you see the quote here from uh, Kathy Tompkins, uh, who is a primary researcher and professor at George Mason University seeing this as a really strong uh, brain health intervention. And here's a bit of the why. It may be counterintuitive, but a brain uh, in idle thought to your left is not as good as a brain that's reading a book out loud uh, to your right, or maybe I've got those reversed on a, on a Zoom screen. Uh, but you can see one where the brain is much more engaged than the other. Similarly, in solving a difficult math problem, only a very small part of the brain is engaged, whereas a much broader context of the brain is engaged when you're doing simple math problems quickly. And this is what uh, Dr. Uh, and Professor uh, Kawashima had found in Tokyo, his brain scans. And so uh, we took the same thing for uh, handwriting, also engaging the brain in a much more engaged way. In fact, uh, just two weeks ago in Japan, they reconfirmed that handwriting uh, was much more effective in terms of memory recall than uh, doing things with tablets, et cetera. And here's an example of, of what we have for stronger memory. Uh, it's meant to be quick math. You know, for some people, this math might be challenging, uh, but for a lot of people, this math it can be done very quickly. And we ask people to you know, complete the math, then read the uh, problems out loud with the answers and time themselves so that instead of an answer key, which we don't provide, because getting the answer right isn't critical, but doing the problem is, uh, we just encourage people to do the problem. So to time themselves initially with our residents is they'd love to uh, share with us that, oh, you know, I've done this for the third time and the first time I did it, it took me two minutes and now it's taking me 30 seconds and, you know, what an improvement. 
So that's what we're looking for, this confidence, this ability for one to have more confidence in their brain function overall. And then writing prompts that we have. Uh, these are the writing prompts, uh, just some uh, samples of writing prompts that we've provided uh, to our Stronger Memory, uh, through our Stronger Memory curriculum. And uh, two things happen with these. One is, well, actually three. One is that we are able to encourage people to write longhand. Uh, we get questions about people typing the answers to these and not quite as effective or not as effective uh, as far as we know. It's really in the handwriting and all the processes that the brain's involved with there. Uh, so handwriting is a key to getting that prefrontal cortex engaged as we understand it. And then what we've also found is that people now uh, who've been doing these programs and filling out these writing prompts uh, have a, almost an autobiography, if you will, of themselves that they can share with their family and loved ones, which is really nice. And we've heard from couples and friends of each other who have engaged with these questions that they end up asking each other and, and get involved into deep conversations uh, conversations that they're not used to having uh, maybe in the last 10, 20 years where they really engage like, oh, you know, let's talk about this from a, from a fun standpoint or a philosophy standpoint. Uh, so we're really reconnecting people socially, uh, which is really nice. So what's the opportunity for village uh, programs and what's the opportunity for you today? Well, first and foremost, just a complete grati gratitude to the Village to Village Network, the work that the 350-odd uh, networks do around the country and around the world, uh, we're grateful for. But we're going to need a lot more solutions like the Village programs to support the growing older adult population. And specifically, thank you to Barbara uh, and to Kim on the board who helped us uh, identify this as an opportunity for the Village Network and uh, the Village to Village Network, and uh, even Kim who helped uh, review our facilitator's guide. So thank you. And thank you to all, thank you, to all of you uh, coming on today. Really appreciate that. So the, one of the things that we wanna do is offer up Stronger Memory as a curriculum, uh, complimentary uh, to you, to your members, to your volunteers. Uh, our intent as a faith-based not-for-profit is to have, help as many people with this program as possible and to keep as few barriers in the way of people doing that. I referenced the facilitator's guide, and this is something that's really critical. Uh, in order to be successful, we think, with Stronger Memory, uh, you have to create a program where people can come together and check in weekly. Uh, I think we've seen time and time again, you know, when people go off to try to do something on their own, they may last for a day or two or maybe a couple of weeks. But if they don't have someone to check in with, if they don't have someone to cheer them on or encourage them along the way, uh, they, they give up. Uh, the momentum uh, goes stale. And so what we've found is we've established weekly check-ins and we want to be able to help others create those weekly check-ins. So we've developed a full facilitator's guide for people, uh, programs, village programs to create so that you, your members, your volunteers can now establish your own weekly check-ins and have your members come together. Uh, and there's really beautiful things that occur uh, that we've already seen in terms of those connections, new friendships, uh, all of a sudden people that were, you know, maybe just reading with them with on their own are now uh, calling uh, a new friend or a new person that they just met and having reading groups on a daily basis. Something that we weren't anticipating, but certainly something that's been a joy. So we want to provide that facilitator's guide uh, to you all and provide you a way to ensure that you're using the facilitator's guide uh, in the appropriate fashion. I think it's fairly um, uh, step by step and, and people can uh, come around it. But we also wanted to offer uh, for those of you in the village programs that want to take advantage of this, that for the first 15 village programs in particular, uh, we would go ahead and support you uh, with your facilitated sessions initially. And we would do that through uh, Jessica Fredrickson, who's with us today. She's our brand new brain health program manager for Goodwin House. And we want this to be as successful as possible. So wanted to start with a group of about 15 and then open ourselves up to um, facilitating even more groups over time. But ultimately having the village to village network participants train each other, uh, train others around you and become experts in this so that you can facilitate other groups uh, becoming stronger memory participants and help more people with their brain health. And our ultimate goal at this stage uh, is for us to be able to help is the support of brain health for 100,000 individuals. Uh, we want uh, to achieve that, and you may say to yourself, 100,000, that seems like a lot, Rob. 
Uh, and 100,000 represents 1% of the 10 million people in our country alone that are impacted by mild cognitive impairment. So if we have 10 million people today, and we know the older adult population is growing, we'll probably have even more in the coming years. We want to at least get to 100,000 individuals with this program and be able to support as many as possible uh, for as long as possible. So Barbara, that's the presentation. I have not been looking at the chat, so if there are questions there, uh, happy to we, answer we them. We have a couple. Rob, that was great. And you know, um, I gotta tell you, just as a previous, uh, you know, um, long-term administrator, but also, you know, a director of my own village, we had a program, like I said, for um, some of our members, and it was specifically for men. It was a men's group who had some mild, and this would be fabulous. Um, and we did it through volunteers. I mean, that's the beauty of it. We had volunteers, other men who wanted to just be interactive with other members of the village. So we do have a couple of questions. So I'm going to start at the top um, and say, um, it's actually a good question. I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask you, um, can you type your journal or is it hand, is handwriting the key? Yeah, certainly um, we would encourage folks to journal however they like. I think it's always helpful, beneficial, candidly. Uh, but in terms of engaging the brain in the most effective way that we're aware of, handwriting is the key. And that was reaff reaffirmed uh, just two weeks ago out of Japan with another study uh, that said, you know, writing by hand was really more helpful uh, to uh, retaining memory. And is that because you're going back to your elementary school training? Yeah, I, I think overall, Barbara, uh, the, the simplicity of this program is off-putting to some people. It's so simple. Like, wait a second, I can just do, you know, handwriting or reading out loud or basic math. Why does that work? And one of the thoughts behind it, because I don't think we have a definitive answer, but one of the thoughts behind it is that the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex of the brain are two of the last parts of the brain to mature. And so as we're going through in our younger years, uh, learning these skills, like really built into us, like how do you read out loud? How do you do handwriting? These are skills that at least in the previous generations were taught consistently. Handwriting, not so much in today's generation, but at least previously. Right. And, and so, um, and doing basic arithmetic. Those are so ingrained in all of us that uh, I think that it is pulling back some of these entrenched uh, recall abilities. And that's what seems to be helpful. Oh, great. Um, Judy asked, um, are the Kumon lesson books unique for the elderly or are they the same for youngsters use? Yeah, that was actually a great question, Judy. That's exactly why we created the program that we did. Uh, we didn't find any program that was out there for older adults. And so we felt like we were compelled to create one. Uh, we, we really studied how uh, the math problem should be laid out. We studied the font size, for example. Uh, we studied what would be important for encouraging people onto the next page. And so that's what you'll find uh, in our program are all those components built into uh, our program. Again, it sounds, and it is not rocket science. It's, it's fairly simple, but it's taken years to figure out you know, the right details and the right way to present this for older adults in particular. And so um, Kumon's really intended for, for younger, um, younger uh, children mm -hmm. or adolescents. Um, I don't know in some of the George Mason, you know, look through, but Lee asked a question whether or not this program works better than some of the other brain health, you know, programs such as the AARP brain health and programs that provide brain games. Has there been any comps with that type of, or is it too early? I, I, it might be too early. I don't know. Uh how definitive, you know, engaging the brain is important. And I think a lot of people talk about, you know, you know if I have this computer app, if I do Sudoku um, uh, all the time, does that help? Uh, I think all those things are probably good. Uh, I don't, I don't, I would never say that, you know, not to en encourage people to go down that path. What we know, what we sense from the work that we've done over the last years, and certainly with my mom, is that these simple reconnecting tools are really powerful. And so I can't speak to all the other programs relative to this. I think it's a it's an end conversation. You know, if you could do this end, I would encourage this as a 20 to 30 minutes, along with 
20 to 30 minutes of movement every day. Like if I was to diagnose or prescribe the one thing that's most important to uh, brain health, it's movement. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that by far and the way is the most effective thing mm -hmm. that we know about. Second probably might be uh, quitting of smoking, for example. Uh, but beyond that, this kind of program, I think uh, really is very strong and helps people in a way that, that other programs may not. Excellent. Actually, Gilda has a great question, and there are many parallels with Parkinson's. So have you done this with Parkinson's patients who have had trouble writing? But many Parkinson's patients also experience dementias. Yeah, we haven't specifically focused on Parkinson's patients. We haven't not focused on Parkinson's patients either. Okay. Uh, we, I've had some people with Parkinson's um, utilize the program in the past. Uh, seen anecdotally um, good results from that, um, people um, benefiting from it, uh, but I don't have a definitiveness around Parkinson's. And Parkinson's itself has so many different variations, variables, um, but I, I don't think any of what we're suggesting, it's all non-pharmacological. Uh, it's all, you know, there's, there's no drugs involved. Uh, there's no side effects to any of what we're talking about today. And so I think none of it has a downside. And, uh, and having that intentional focus really is the key. Um, not Parkinson's related, but just my, my dad related, I would share uh, for a number of years, he's been on the sideline uh, saying, you know, yeah, I don't need to do this kind of work. I, I, do, I do enough. I handle a lot of things with, you know, stocks and, and writing out lists for groceries. And, and I, I keep coming back to him and saying, yeah, yeah, that's all good. And it's the intentional 20 to 30 minutes a day that really is critical, staying consistent with that. And we're just now, I mean, it's been almost 10 years with my mom, we're just now getting him uh, over to the idea that, oh yeah, you know, this does create focus when I, when I do these kind of programs. Uh, better to do these type of programs consistently. I think you answered this next question in the ARP, like the other brain games, but doing crossword puzzles in Sudoku, um, it's a different level if you've done it all the way through. Um, it continues to be, you know, teasing your brain. But yeah, I, I, I love Sudoku and, uh, and, and uh, enjoy crossword puzzles myself. I wasn't doing those when I was, was younger, when it was, I was in first grade or second grade, when my brain was really uh, early in its process of developing. And I would say that um, those are probably good. Uh, no, no, no qualms with them. I can't speak to the effectiveness of doing that day in and day out. What I can tell you is 20 minutes of dedicated work here uh, on these three simple areas uh, over the course of a month uh, may have a really positive impact on people. Uh, so no, no, no downside with the other things, but I, I think a lot of potential upside with what we're talking about. There's a couple of questions in here um, and I haven't skipped through, but maybe you can address um, uh, the facilitators. Somebody asked if they're paid staff, who actually, who would, you know, be the person to interact and do this, not just, you know, Jessica being helpful, but within, you know, so we have villages that are all volunteer and villages that are, you know, do have some paid staff. Do you have to be a professional to be trained in this? Can you be a caregiver and yeah. do it? Yeah, great question. Uh, so uh, our, my answer to that at this stage is anyone can be a facilitator. Uh, what's necessary to be a really great facilitator is you have to have a positive attitude you have to be encouraging. Uh, so one of the biggest uh, takeaways from the work that we've been doing over the years is that if you bring anxiety to the process, you will um, minimize the success of the program. If you bring a, a sense of, you know, someone's doing math problems and, and as a facilitator, you say to the person, you know, come on, you can get that. That's simple. You, you got that wrong. If you do that kind of language, uh, you'll automatically lose uh, that person's effectiveness to, to actually have any improvement. And so what a facilitator needs to be is committed to a consistency. Uh, that's probably step one. Uh, so constantly being there, if it's, if it's weekly, which we would recommend, uh, that would be great, but consistent on the time and, and, the, and the positive approach. Um, those are the two things that a facilitator really needs. It doesn't matter whether a facilitator is paid or a volunteer. Uh, we do have a full guide that now takes you through the process, gives you a curriculum and a, pro and a, and a um, suggested approach to be a facilitator, to be an effective facilitator, so that you can have a group, uh, create cohesiveness, uh, make sure people want to come back week in, week out. 
Uh, so we have the whole program available uh, now. That's part of what we want to make sure uh, we provide to the village to village network members. Um, just quickly, do you see this as an, an effective prevention tool for people who may not experience, you know, cognitive decline, but are worried maybe? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and some of the conversations we've had even with our own residents and members of Goodwin House at Home as of late in, in Northern Virginia area, uh, you know, folks that have been doing it for months and say, you know, I'm not noticing any great improvement and I'm not noticing any decline. And our answer to that, our response to that is, Grace, uh, you're, you're maintaining. Maintenance of, of brain health is absolutely great as an as a end goal. Uh, and if it doesn't result in absolute improvement, you know, that, that's also understandable. Uh, but someone who doesn't necessarily have mild cognitive impairment or early onset of dementia, uh, this program is still valuable, you know, spending that 20 to 30 minutes a day. Uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Kawashima wrote some books and, and uh, published books, and they were uh, mostly picked up, as I understand it, by 20 and 30 year olds uh, to help increase their focus and their, their ability to concentrate early on. So uh, very similar in approach uh, at any age. So Wendy, uh, who's on our board, um, asked, um, what does this look like in the, you know, today in the age of Zoom? And is this program more logistically possible in a facility like Goodwin House? But what about via telephone? I mean, it, it's most, I mean, what I've done, and I've personally done it with a family member, um, and it you could do it on the phone and say, okay, here's your sheet. Um, and now I want you to read it back to me, right? What you, you know, you know, do. And like you said, Rob, it's not important that they got the numbers correct. It's how fast they did it. So you, you answer the question, but. Yeah, Barbara, I, I agree with you uh, fully. You know, we uh, started off in person. Uh, certainly that was what we, we started off with. And I, and I think there's a, a certainly an effectiveness to that. Uh, socialization that occurs with that. Uh, as of March of last year, all of us were forced to shift and change and approach this through a technology land, uh, lens. And so Jessica, uh, who is now facilitating Zoom uh, sessions with our members at Goodwin House at Home. Uh, my mom is on those, for example, as an invited guest. And so we're, we're finding it to be as effective uh, with the check-in and maybe even more helpful as a check-in um, uh, with technology. Uh, so I think both ways can work. Uh, I think if you uh, want to forego uh, Zoom altogether or coming in person altogether, but you just want to do it by phone, um, that's great. Uh, no, no problems there. It's the consistency and the encouragement to do so on a daily basis that's really a uh, key. So uh, the check-in is really a, a part of accountability and allowing people to feel like they're, they're achieving and being accountable. How many units are in the curriculum just currently? Yeah, so uh, we've created uh, 16 uh, uh, stages for math and uh, 150 uh, word prompts uh, today, uh, or prompt, writing prompts today, uh, so far. And can the, I assume, I don't ever like using that word, but um, you could reuse the math problems. You could reprint it and do it, you know, so you use the 15 and then you reprint them and start another two week cycle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, my mom's been repeating the same curriculum even through Kumon for years, uh, but you know, she just goes with the flow and, and does the math again. Uh, and so uh, with our program, uh, we, it's not exhaustive, right? We don't have a sheet uh, for, for every day or multiple sheets for every day of the year type of thing. Uh, people will go through it at their own pace uh, some will take longer to get through more stages. Some won't be able to go beyond stage one. Uh, and so you just sort of halt there and repeat stage one material. Uh, how do you do that most effectively? Uh, so, you know, we have a really good team, uh, Goodwin House, uh, and uh, some of them have been teachers before and said, oh, why don't you grab a plastic sheet, uh, put it over uh, a, a, a math sheet and just use dry erase marker uh, to uh, write the answers, and then you can reuse that sheet as often as you want. You just wipe down the um, plastic sheet that you put over the, the one page of math. So lots of ways to reuse, and, uh, and I think that is something that people do get used to. As I referenced, 
uh, in our pilot group, uh, people were you know on their third or fourth round of doing similar math, but they were comparing their times. They were really excited that they'd seen a progress from doing a, a two minute math sheet down to a 30 second math sheet, uh, which was really encouraging for folks. Alan asked if you have um, the journal citation for Dr. Thompson's paper or even better, a copy of the paper? Uh, it's a report on stronger memory that's just coming out. And so uh, I believe uh, be, as soon as it's available um, publicly, we'll, we'll certainly be able to have that or have that up on our site. Uh, but it just came out this month. So uh, we'll and, be able to come around that fairly soon. And Rob, if you don't mind, oh, um, so I was talking with our, our researchers yesterday about um, that report. And so what we've done so far is an initial report. And we're really excited with these uh, next groups that we're leading at Goodwin House. And we hope if any villages in the future are interested in well, we can include your participants. Um, we've done kind of the exploratory research and seen great results. And we're looking to get um, even more detail and a more formal uh, journal article put together after those results are in. Yeah, okay. right. Thanks, Jessica. That'd be great. This and by the way, this is this is Jessica, who's the brain health program manager. Hi. So. <laughs> Which is a great great time, and I think a great part of what the village you know, can help the village village network can help us with is uh, members who want to participate and help solidify the research the, the initial research that's been done uh, on this program. Um, what? How long does it typically go through? You know, a practice skill day. I mean, like, are you looking at you know, an hour or like, especially with the, when they go back and they want to write like their, their, you know, where they, where they would like to go that day, you know, whatever. Um, so for people that are doing the program, how long does it take for them to do? A, a daily, day? yeah, a practice skill day. What, what would it, how long would it take? Yes, yeah, so 20, it's 20 to 30 minutes a day. I think that's day. what they're asking. Yes. Of doing how much time each day. Yep, of doing a combination of um, of quick math, uh, non anxiety uh, ridden math, if you will, uh, doing reading out loud, uh, and and or uh, doing the handwriting, uh, the writing prompts. And our writing prompts are not, you know, there's there's no sacred ground there. If people want to do something other than our writing prompts, that's fine too. Uh, we've had a lot of folks uh, writing about their family history, and. Uh, in their own right. You can get a twofer because you can write write what you want and then read it out loud to others, uh, which is a nice way to go about it. Um, similar to reading material, uh, folks can read whatever they like. You know, if it's religious reading that they really enjoy every day, great. If it's the newspaper, great. Uh, you know, there's lots of different ways to come around the reading material. Uh, we have found some who have uh, deeper cognitive challenges uh, really do well with uh, With Dr. Sue. So I'm assuming that reading to your grandchildren would be a really great stimulating, you know. Absolutely. Reading to your grandchildren, finding a, a child in the, in the current school system that you're a part of and being a mentor to them and, and doing a reading session with them, uh, helping them up uh, would be great too. Yeah, all, all those things are really powerful. Um, I know you're not a doctor, but we had a question about, you know, as a baseline, where do you go for the initial mild cognitive assessment? Um, and I don't know if you want to give yeah, an answer a, on that. It's a good question. Jessica, did you want to um, reference that? Yeah, absolutely. I can answer that. Um, so there are several assessments that can be used as a screening tool. Um, for mild cognitive impairment or early signs of dementia, um, like the MOCA, which is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Um, and usually any social worker or physician can, can screen for those. There are also some online um, and like places you can call. The Alzheimer's Association can do some phone screenings. But if you're really concerned, the best place to start would be with your primary care physician, and they are able to do um, that initial screening. 
in the facilitator's guide, which we'll share, there's a, also a whole page that you can print out as a resource with uh, various places you can go to kind of get that baseline screening. So we have a lot of chatter um, in the um, forum, and I'm not going to address all of them. Uh, one, it's pretty much how do they get the materials? Do they have to purchase it? Do they have to go through you? Do they come through us? How do you want to be the you know the 15 included? I'm I'm sure my emails are are blowing up right now. Um, so <laughs> we didn't even really talk about that, Rob. <laughs> <but> <laughs> Yeah, I think I think the way that we had um, thought through it, although didn't solidify, was uh, Barbara. I think you be you'll be sending an email to all the participants of this program, uh, validating uh, who would be wanting to be you know be involved. Uh, then we would you would bring that information back to myself and Jessica. Uh, we would uh, work with uh, again the first fifteen. The, the reason why we're talking about fifteen initially groups is because we want to make sure that we have uh, the bandwidth and support. Uh, we're, we're providing this complimentary, so there is no charge to the program. Uh, there is, we're work, you know, we worked out a way for the, the full uh, program to be printed, or at least the initial documents, which is about 250 pages worth to be printed at a, as a, at a reasonable cost. Uh, so if someone wants to have it printed out versus printing it out uh, themselves, uh, that's, that would be a cost. But outside of that, uh, we really want to support as many people as possible. Uh, this, the, the work that Jessica is doing is being supported by the Goodwin House Foundation, uh, which we're grateful for, uh, and certainly uh, as a faith-based not-for-profit, uh, it's in line with our mission. Uh, but that's how I think we're, we're going to go about it, is uh, you, you'll be getting it. And hopefully what we'll find quickly is uh, we'll, we'll get those first 15 up and running well, and then uh, be able to train more people to take on more groups, you know, if, if there are multiple groups in a market area or uh, you know, someone who feels confident with the program can help another uh, village group somewhere else. Uh, that's the goal. Our goal is to certainly extend this well beyond um, Goodwin House, well beyond uh, just one or 15 uh, village groups, but to, to make this as uh, available as possible to as many people as possible throughout the country. So let me clarify also, I mean, thank you, Jessica, for putting in um, the, the website. Um, and the packets, um, I went online and I downloaded like one or two of them just to explore it with my family member. And um, I thought it was awesome. The cost to the village is printing. So, you know, you can do it in-house, you can go to Staples and get it cheap, but, and then duplicate it. Um, the 15 that are going to, you know, contact me directly um, uh, will be the ones working with Jessica at first. And so that will be the structure. And as far as, you know, I, a good question, um, Barbara Bernstein was, um, is there a optimum size of a group if they decide to put a group together? Is it it's a good idea just to have a small group setting and not be, you know, um, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I think we've seen groups um, from eight to 20 um, thereabouts in terms of participants, uh, but you're trying to, the sessions ultimately that we, uh, that we like to facilitate are typically around 30 minute sessions. So we're not having check-ins that are you know, four hours or longer. Uh, we're, we're hoping people will come, uh, that they'll check in, uh, we'll be able to talk with them about how things are going, uh, maybe share some information and insights, uh, go around to each person uh, as a check-in and then uh, continue on. So if you get larger than 20, that makes it harder um, for, for that check-in to be as efficient at 30 minutes as possible. Uh, so uh, that's, that's what we're looking at at this stage. Okay. And, Is there um, an optimum age of, in, of participants? No, no optimum age. Just interested, interested parties who want to stay consistent with it. That, that would be the key. So um, Wendy asked a good question, and, and you, you pointed to it earlier was, this is not a test, so there's no pre and post test. You don't really, you know, circle. It's more about the, the stimulation within the brain. Um, and there's no measure of, you know, whether or not it's a test. It's, or whether or not, I guess, Wendy, Wendy, why don't you ask more in depth? Are you there? Wendy? 
Well, maybe she'll come on. No, no, I'm here. I just had to find the control to unmute myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I mean, it's not a test of do they know the math, but it's a test of what level of improvement do we see. Okay, so right. And I figured that. So there a test yeah. and then a post-test to say, yeah, I saw this level of improvement other than anecdotal, I feel better. Yeah, that's right. Uh, most, of, most of why we've wanted to get this out as soon as possible uh, is that you know, we've had enough anecdotal knowledge that it, it works well. Uh, it's based on a program uh, out of Japan that's been in place for, for you know, a number of years uh, and has had a consistent success. So uh, the, the focus for us is to um, have people engage uh, with the program as soon as possible and, and start to benefit. It does take about a month of time uh, we experience about, sometimes it's two weeks, but typically it's about a month of people staying consistent with it at least four times a week uh, to really benefit from, uh, from the program itself. And the math, as you uh, reflected, Wendy, it doesn't even matter if you get the answers right. We don't have an answer key, um, which actually my mom uh, doesn't like. <laughs> she wants to have an answer key. She wants to know that she's got it all right. I, I certainly um, create their own answer key so that they can <laughs> so they can check themselves. But that's fine. Uh, that's not not a problem. Uh, our goal was to create math problems that were were uh, people were able, were able to do them without concern uh, for getting the answers right, but just go through the function of doing the problems. And so um, that's that's the key. And over time, uh, hopefully, see that improvement uh, or at least the stabilization. Uh, you know, stabilization is a win for us uh, with this program. That's good. Nellie, um, in answer to your question, you can follow the program on your own. Um, you don't need to, you know, go back uh, through Jessica if you don't want to. Sometimes it's helpful just for the structure in the beginning, but most certainly this is a program to work independently within, you know, our village. Um, my understanding, right, Rob? Yeah. Um, you were doing it. Um, and um, so I would say, you know, it's your comfort level. If you can, you know, run with it, that's great. We would love for you to give us feedback. Um, that would be something we'd ask uh, because we are rolling it out to our network villages. Um, and there was another question about, you know, doing something like this for a group of villages like WAVE. We did talk to Rob about WAVE. Um, and, you know, there might be a, um, once we get beyond this and is this test pilot time, you know, presenting to WAVE, you know, in, in addition, uh, because obviously they're, they're based in Northern Virginia, so they're in that, you know, catchment area. Um, so I think it most certainly can be. Um, yeah, so, and, and Barbara, I would just say to the, to the folks that want to, you know, get going on this, um, great. Uh, one of the reasons why we're so excited to be working with, with you, Barbara, and the Village to Village Network is we think this can create a helpful differentiator for you all. A more value add so that you have a program that's unique in your market areas that you can you know claim as a you know you've got the check-ins you've got the volunteers that are supporting now you've got another way to encourage people mm -hmm. to join your your village programs uh, that we see this as, a, as an absolute win for you all uh, we certainly want to keep the program itself complimentary uh, and again i think people that start off on it complimentary are going to have a hard time if they don't have some group to check in with uh, to some benefit to um, be accountable to or group to be accountable to. So that's where the, the real be beauty, I think, for the village. They, they, somebody just asked if they can get a copy of the facilitator's guide. Do they have to, I think you said in the beginning you were going to forward that over to us anyway. So we'll have accessibility to, to hand it off to the 15. Um, so if they don't get one of the 15 pilot that Jess is going to, Jess is going to work on it. Um, well, you know. Yeah, our, our, our intent is to have the facilitator's guide available to, to everyone. Uh, okay. And I think that that's our goal. Yeah. And, it, 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 and it's it ready. It is ready. <laughs> and I'd be happy to answer questions on the facilitator's guide. I got a couple of um, private messages uh, about that as well. So, uh, you know, if you have a background, you're familiar with programs like this, and you feel like you can take the facilitator's guide and, and run with it, we're happy, uh, happy to provide that as well. And Jessica, just um, if you don't mind, would you put your email address, your contact information in the chat? Absolutely. So that they have it, you know, they may want to, you know, um, 
ask you questions directly if you don't mind, but um, that's not to sign up for one of the 15. That's just <laughs> to ask specific questions about the facilitator guide. <laughs> uh, Rob, are um, you saying the small group should meet four times a week? No, um, the groups, the check-in, uh, we uh, encourage at least once a week. Uh, so that, that's the minimal standard there. Uh, in terms of doing the program uh, participants, we encourage the participants to do it four, five, six, seven times a week, at, at minimum four times a week. And so um, how that becomes important is uh, some people who have a, a partner, uh, you know, they have a, maybe an advantage to having someone make sure that they're staying with it daily. Uh, if you have a volunteer that's you know calling up and saying, "Hey, just wanted to check in, see if you you know, you know how how did stronger memory go today um, from the village uh, networks?" Then great. You know, again, that's a value add. Won't take very long, but will be very advantageous. So I think that's where we're looking at trying to encourage people to stay consistent with it uh, throughout. Well, good. I don't see any other questions. Jessica put in. Her email to Goban House right there, so you can see that. Um, and I don't know what else. I mean, please, you know, feel free to contact Travis or myself at the B2B email address. I'll put it in here. Um, and um, I've already had a couple of people say they want to participate, you know, through the chat. Um, I'm happy. Um, I I am in particular going to continue with it. Uh, so. Um, I'll look at the facilitator's guide and, and actually talk to my local village up here at the Jersey Shore because I think it's a really great program. So, Well, thank you so much for the chance to speak with all of you today. Uh, I want to thank my, my mom in particular for her uh, willingness to spearhead so much of this effort and, uh, and be willing uh, to share her experiences and, uh, and my dad and all the team at Goodwin House, uh, you know, our, our uh, folks that have been helping get our website uh, prepared to make it as accessible as possible, and Kathy Miller, et cetera, uh, and certainly Jessica. Uh, really appreciate, appreciate everyone's effort uh, to date and really excited for our future. Uh, really thank you for helping us help uh, 100,000 people with their brain health uh, through this program. Well, thank you, because this is a huge, um, you know, endeavor, but also a very fulfilling, I'm sure. Um, please know everybody, we will um, be patient with us. It is a holy week. So <laughs> Travis will download the, uh, the um, video and we will post it in the forums as soon as we have it um, so that you all can look at it again and share it with your uh, other village members. Um, and thanks, Rob. Thanks, Jessica. We appreciate your time uh, and energy and, and look forward to working with you uh, in the next couple of weeks. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thank Anytime. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye Thank now. Thank you. Congrats.